afternoon, ladies and gents. Welcome to Poetry Africa. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, very excited about this event. Um, we're going to be talking the book Wild Imperfections. I would like to welcome you to the session. And just to remind you guys, the Poetry for Africa Festival is brought to you by uh, the University of KwaZulu Natal, and we are thanking our partners, which is the uh, French Institute of South Africa, Total South Africa, the US Embassy, and our technical partner, Hear My Voice. We thank you so much for joining us. Um, today, it's just a quick introduction. I'm going to hand it over to our facilitator for the session, Natalia Mulebati, who's an MC, a poet, a writer, and all sort of things. Welcome to the session. Hello, hello, Natalia. Hello, Sipindile. Hello, world. Hello. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I am so honored. I am privileged to be in this space. Thank you, Poetry Africa and your partners for giving us this opportunity. We thank our ancestors, those who come before us, for giving us our voices. Um, today was supposed to be the launch of, or rather the first launch of Wild Imperfections, a global anthology of womanist uh, poems. But then again, Kororo, Kororo, Corona happened and we found ourselves in this space. Um, this book is uh, featuring poets from across the black world um, because we are everywhere. And this world is made on our backs. This world is made on the backs, the sweat, the blood of our ancestors, and it continues to be so. Um, this book is really a reminder and a space of gathering, uh, of memorializing ancestors such as um, Sarah Bartman, Rosa Parks, Dulce September, and Nina Simone, among others. Um, today, though, I sit with some of the contributors. If I should just mention some of the contributors who are not here before I mention the ones who are here. Um, this book is richly um, and generously contributed to by um, just wonderful poets from across the world, such as uh, uh, obviously Diana Ferris, Nikki Giovanni, and Maneo Muhale, who I'll be in conversation with today. Um, Stacey Enchin, Khadija Sase, Jackie Kay, Nobis Philip, uh, Cheryl Clark, Kolega Putuma, Lebohang Mashile, Montaza Mary, Jamela Osman, Warsan Shire, Safia El Hilo, Miriam um, Alves, and I'm telling you from Soweto to Somalia to the US, to the UK, to Colombia, to Cuba, to Brazil, to the Dominican Republic, to everywhere because we are everywhere. Today though, I want to welcome some of the giants of the poetry world that if I had to introduce them to you and read their poems, dear world, uh, we are going to sit here for a very long time. I'm going to start from the youngest one, Maneo Mohale from 1992. Diana and, and Nikki, can you imagine? Um, a South African editor, feminist writer and poet, and a non-binary person. Very important to note that some people are gender non-binary and it's important to know that uh, some womanists are non-binary. Their work has appeared in, in various local and international publications, including Jalada, Proof Rock, The Beautiful Project, The Mail and Amp, um, Guardian, Spectrum.za, and others. And um, 
Diana Ferras, a writer, poet, storyteller, a creative writing workshop facilitator. Her work has been published in various collections and some serve as prescribed text for high school learners. She also works closely with schools, especially matriculants. You will remember that her book and poem, I've Come to Take You Home, dedicated to the, the, the Venus uh, hot and taut as she was known, our very own Sarah Barkman is a poem that actually led to our ancestors return um, to her rightful home. And um, I am introducing again the renowned poet on whose shoulders we all stand on, Nikki Giovanni, who needs no introduction, who has written so many po uh, uh, poetry uh, um, books and essay books and ed uh, edited collections and received um, so many awards from the NAACP to the Langston Hughes Medal to the Carl Sandbury Literary Award um, as a living legend to just so many to mention. I am honored and privileged to speak to you beyond um, the Pan-African world across generations. Welcome to the space. Say hello to the people. Hello, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I want to speak to, to you about solidarity in the Pan-African world, about collaborations, but before I delve into that world, um, into that, that, that work um, uh, of our time together, I want to speak about how you've been, how your hearts have been this year. If one thing we've learned about this year is that we're not in control, or at least there are certain things we can never be in control over, this global pandemic has forced us to be tech savvy. I don't know if um, I'm tech savvy yet, but this, this pandemic beyond it being so rough on us, it has also brought us police brutality. And as if people could not get any poorer, um, it has brought people also to the streets in protest saying, we have had enough. Um, women across the world saying we're done with patriarchy and misogyny. And in all of this mix, how have your sightings, your observations, your spirit, your reflections been on this time? And again, I'm going to start with Maneo from The Youngest. I'm joking. I'm not an ageist. Maneo, how have you been? Um, I've, I've been many things. I think that Right at the beginning of this, um, of of the of the onset of the of the pandemic, I I read Arundhati Roy's brilliant essay, "The Pandemic as a Portal," and it felt it felt really good to ground myself in the in that writing and and in that space because it's it's the pandemic has brought so much uncertainty and anxiety and deep grief, deep grief to so many of us, um, but what was grounding about that essay is in showing that the pandemic just worsened what was already there um, mm -hmm. and, and exacerbated, especially being a South African um, and being one of the most unequal countries in the world, that it just exacerbated and exposed and um, shone a, a brutal spotlight on the inequalities and equities that, that we, we have as a society. Personally, it's been very difficult. Um, I've lost an elder um, to, to COVID and, and my family is still trying to figure out how to grieve through that. And even as young people and being very, I feel, I feel my youth, I feel it on this panel, but even as, as young people, we are in such a strange um, middle space, such a deeply liminal space. Um, where we are, we're grieving 
the the world as we know it, this normal, but as as queer and as trans people, that we understand that normal has never been um, as an an equitable space, a just space for us. Um, so it's it's been a lot. I'm mishmashed also in in my brain. I'm still moving through it because it's not over. I'm still moving through what it means to be a, a person. Um, also trying to be in deep solidarity with people during this time through mutual aid and through checking in with each other and chosen family. There's so many ways that we show up for each other that have been beautiful in this time, even though it's been a time um, infused with so much grief. Mm. Well, well, thank you. I mean, we don't want to ignore this, this time and just speak as if we have not lived through a historical moment. Um, I'll go to Diana and then um, end up with, with Nikki. Thank you, um, Natalia. You know, this time, uh, this pandemic has really, you know, played havoc with me, with my mind, with my, my body. And um, I had to concentrate hard on staying sane, on working out methods how to survive because we were also touched financially. But you know, as somebody who does uh, writing workshops, who writes, who writes about women, grassroots women, no, writes about, who works with grassroots women, I saw that this pandemic had the ability to mute women's voices. And for me, I suddenly realized that it's important that we keep the pace of uh, women, you know, talking of women writing. And if, because this pandemic has got the, um, could make us disappear, you know, take away our voices. And uh, that's why it, um, in this, I survived by writing myself and also working with other women, women writers who wanted their work edited, you know, wanted to talk about um, their writing. I, I made sure that I was there for discussions, you know, over Zoom um, and um, small then small get togethers and all that. But uh, I realized that we had to keep this going. Otherwise we were going to disappear and we must be mindful of that. And for that, I just wanted to quote one of Nikki's poems where she says, show me someone not full of herself and I'll show you a hungry person. So we always have to be full of ourselves in this world to survive and not to get hungry. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And over to you, Nikki. Well, thank you. I, 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 I guess I'm, I know I'm the oldest person here and I guess I'm the one that looks at things very, very differently. But one of the things that I miss, let me talk about what I miss, is cooking with each other. And so many of the people I loved cooking with and talking with and being sister, sisterly with, I miss Margaret Walker. I used to go down to Jackson, Mississippi with my son and I would cook with Margaret and we would talk. Margaret is wonderful. I miss Tony Morrison, who was a good friend. And as Tony got ill, as, as you know, as Tony was in a wheelchair and couldn't get around, she liked porgies. And so I would, find wherever I was, if I could find a port, it was usually at the Chelsea Market in, in New York. And then I would go up to her home on, uh, on Hudson on the Bay and I would fry fish. And I was always laughing because Tony and I could spend the whole afternoon and probably not say a half a dozen, a half a dozen words, but the cooking together. And I see now that the men are taking over the cooking. I see that Marcus Samuelson is taking over the cooking. I see that, that uh, Michael Twitty is taking over the cooking. So I'm really glad to see that the men, that our sons have learned something from us. And one of the things they've learned is that you've got to come uh, together. You've got to come together to do it. We women also, of course, we quilt together. And I think that's something that we miss. I'm an American, so I'm, I'm speaking outside of what I know in, in terms of, of the African, uh, the continent, but we, we quilted together. We had uh, my Aunt Cleota, who uh, just passed uh, actually two years ago now, had kept her uh, address from when she was in high school. 
And she kept writing me and saying, you know, Nikki, you haven't, uh, she lived in Cincinnati, I lived in here in Virginia. You haven't written a poem for me. And I said, Cleota, you haven't, you haven't quilted for me. And so I'm not gonna do a poem until you do. And she ended up, uh, and I'm glad she did because she passed up shortly after that. She quilted a poem for me, a, 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 a quilt for me. And I, of course, sent her a poem. And I think the things that we used to do together, we're, we're letting maybe people push us apart a little bit. Um, we all know it, we're going to die one day. It, it's, it's not recommended, but it's going to happen. So you don't, it's not something you have to worry about. It, you're going to die. If you were born, you're going to die. And that being the case, it's good to come together. And I have come together with, with my, we play uh, with, with friends of mine, we play uh, a, a game called Bid Whist. I don't know if you know Bid Whist, but it's kind of like um, canasta and it's kind of like whist. And we played it in high school. And so we play together, we play Bid Whist. And somebody said, well, aren't you afraid you're going to catch something? I said, I've already caught something. I live in America. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what more can I catch? <laughs> we do. We come together and we play cards. And as Diana was saying, I think it's, I think it's important and significant that we enjoy our lives because we don't know how long. And, and I really, I'm not indifferent to the, the, the COVID. I'm not indifferent actually to, to most things, but I just don't see that, that the biggest worry, the biggest worry in my life is not COVID-19, but, but Donald Trump. And so with any luck, he will drop dead or die or be whatever, whatever takes him off this earth because it's the Nazis that are really disturbing us. It's the Nazis who are trying to make a comeback and it's the Nazis who would like, of course, to kill us. And it's the women who are not going to allow that to happen. We are not going to allow that. You can look at the civil rights movement. That I'm not going to take up more time than I'm supposed to. But when we look at the civil rights movement, it's the women who ran the civil rights movement because we did the cooking so that the men could do the walking, going, going back to the Montgomery bus boycott. The women have always done that, going back to Fannie Lou Hamer. We vote. And I remind everybody of that. And I don't know when we're going to be live here. If you're in America, you must vote because Fannie Lou Hamer was beaten half to death as she fought with Lyndon Johnson about the right to vote. She's a Mississippian. And what she, she put together a, a group called the Free, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. And when she went back to Mississippi, they took her off the bus and just beat her and beat her. And I said, and I hope that everybody else thinks that. As long as there's any piece of me, I've laughed with a friend of mine. I said, if my liver is still just, just trim, trembling a little bit, take the liver to the poll and have it, have it vote. You have to vote. That's just something you have to do. And you can't let somebody like Donald Trump, who hates you, determine what you do. Whatever Donald Trump hates about you, you know, you absolutely know you don't want to do. Our soror, not, I'm a Delta, but she's an AKA Alpha Kappa Alpha. My soror, our soror, uh, Kamala, Kamala Harris said on television a couple of days ago now, if Donald Trump tells me to get a, a vaccination, I'm not gonna do it. And I thought, good for, good for Senator Harris. Tell it like it is because whatever Donald Trump is telling you is not good for you. And we know he's grabbing those girls on the border. We know he's grabbing those 12, and, and, and 13 year old girls and selling them into the, into the sex trade. So there are some things you know, about raising our voices. There are some things that our voices have to be raised about because there's probably not a black woman or a brown woman on earth that hasn't been abused. But I live in Appalachia. So there isn't a white woman who hasn't too. And I keep reminding the Appalachians, you know, we were not the only black women were not the only women who were lynched. White women were lynched and they've tried to keep that story quiet. But there is a story about the lynching of white women in Appalachia who were helping the enslaved escape. It's just there's some stories and, and we have to keep I'm telling talking, them. Talk, talking about these stories and, and, and keeping on telling them. I mean, for example, in, in this book that that brought us together here, you, me, Diana, Maneo, the, the wild imperfections, we we find names like Fanny Lou Hammer, we find names like Winnie Mandela, we find names like 
uh, um, Albertina Sisulu, who um, one of the contributors, our great Trinam uh, Thorpe uh, has, has contributed some poems where she, she writes about Albertina Sisulu. And this space, these spaces of, of, of gathering, I mean, I, I, the three of you are editors. You, you bring particularly women together, particularly black, women together, these African, Pan-African uh, um, uh, uh, writers and, and artists together as editors. What do you intend to do um, with, with these work? And, and beyond your intentions, what are the difficulties? What are the complexities um, of, of bringing these, these work together? What has changed? I mean, I, I will come to you, Nikki, um, but I, I, I'm very interested in how night comes softly. I mean, this, was, this happened in the 1960s, and here we are talking about Wild Imperfections, which is coming out in 2021. And 55, 60 years has passed. You know, uh, Diana, you are in the Western Cape, um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, when the Dutch arrived in the Western Cape, they saw the most beautiful landscape in the world. And they're like, we're staying, we're yeah. we <laughs> natives. And here you are working with the Mengelmus poets and putting together uh, collectives and, and work that I believe are really an archive of the future. I want to start with you and, and take us through this this work of, of collecting and gathering women together and in these spaces. And what are you trying to do? I know it's difficult. Um, yes, look, we were not allowed to tell our stories during mm -hmm. apartheid, during mm -hmm. the whole long years of colonialism. There's not, a, there's little stories or maybe even not one story that's why we, we cannot recall how, not recall, but we know little bits of how our ancestors lived, but we were not allowed to write our stories. We, it was stories were orally told. What, uh, what's, what's that our children gonna have when they are our ages, you know, my age? I want them to be able to go and take a book and to say, oh, this happened in that year. Or this is how grandma, you know, um, lived. And that is why mama is like this, because this is what grandma taught her. So for me, it is, you know, the, the canon uh, um, that there is on the other side. We want to smash it. We want to tell them that canon that you build up for yourself and now they are gatekeepers that are deciding who's coming through the gate. We want to show you that we don't need the cannon. We don't need the gate. We are climbing anyway. Yeah. So that is the reason, you know, um, it's, 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 I'm particularly, uh, you know, interested in, in, in the voice, in women's voices, in telling those stories so that we cannot um, sit still with, we don't know who we are. Yeah. We want to know who we are. We want to know who we are. We've always, I guess, wanted to, to know who we are. And, and I'm coming to you, Nikki, now about how, um, how Night Comes Softly happened. I mean, in the 60s, did you have publishers? I'm happy to say that, um, with wild imperfections, well, I mean, I'm I'm putting wild imperfections in there. Excuse me, Cassava Republic <laughs> Press, which is a feminist-run publisher, um, is going to be taking this book, um, run by a brilliant Bibi Bakara Yusuf, is going to be taking this book um, globally. Um, Penguin uh, a Random House is going to be taking it in South Africa. Well, here's Night Comes Softly and here's young Nikki Giovanni. Um, <laughs> this, 
with this vision, with this dream? How did you, what, what, did, what were you thinking and what has changed um, in 2020? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, back then, first of all, there, were, there was, we had no connection of women speaking like that. We had no women, no, no group of women coming together. I put it together and, and I thought, well, somebody's going to do something with it. Uh, I was mentioning earlier, I did a book, uh, Standing in the Need of Prayer. Mm -hmm. I was listening to Diana talking about we're, we're marching, but there's an old spiritual, we are climbing Jacob's ladder. Every round goes higher and higher. I put Night Comes Softly together because uh, of a poem of, of Langston Hughes, Night Comes Softly, Black Like Me. And I thought, well, we can do it. And it sells or it doesn't. I'm a big girl, so I've heard no before. And I think that's true of any, any writer. Once you have heard no, then everything else is open up because you're not afraid. Oh yeah, I know what no is. And I, I, I was very pleased because I did Night Come Softly, but Toni Morrison, who became not only my good friend, but way more important in terms of writing, Toni ended up with the black book and had the same, it's really interesting, the same problems. And the black book is just being reissued. And I'm so, I'm so pleased that it is. And of course they waited till Tony was dead, but the black book needed to be reissued because Tony did the same thing. She brought things together. America, no matter how we look at it, is either a stew or a soup or a quilt because it's a bunch of things brought together to make something else. One of, if not the most important people in America, of course, are black women. We have birthed all children. All we have to do is look right, right. Just look at us. You can look at the color. We were raped. We were, uh, <laughs> I don't know what, we were, uh, uh, I guess, uh, persuaded. We were seduced. I don't know. But we have everybody's child, black, white, and brown, Indian. We have everybody's child. We did what any good mother would do. We reared that child. We loved that child. And we took that child one step further. We were talking about stories. Every child, and I say that to my class, every child hears stories before they were born. Their mother is carrying them. I have a son. Their mother is carrying them. And he's, she's telling stories, you know, this is what life is, this is what you're gonna be. And we're singing songs to our children. Our children come out hearing spirituals and they take that spiritual and they make whatever, something else out of it. They make, uh, I was laughing with my class because you have, you know, Mary had a little lamb and then they make it jazz. If you have, you know, Herbie Hancock does something else entirely with it. And I think that's important. Or uh, the three little bears. Once upon a time, there was a little nursery around about the three bears, boom, boom, boom. We took what we had, is what I'm trying to say, and made, made something out of it. And I think it's really important. I was talking about food earlier. Really important to realize that women got up before dark, before it was light. Yeah. We got up and put dinner on so that we could go out into the fields. Those of us who worked in the fields, some of us worked in the house, some of us worked in the bedroom, doesn't matter. We all went to work before it was light. And we put dinner on so that when all of us, when the husbands and the children came in from work, we could sit down to a hot meal. I think that's fabulous. And then everybody wants to talk about what, what is American cuisine? Any day is black. And I, I'm always saying it because I refuse. I would starve to death before I eat Kentucky fried chicken because there's not a white man on earth that fried a chicken. And we know that. We know that. So we, we go forward. We go forward celebrating black you know, women. I want to be in your class, that's one. <laughs> that's one and I've been trying to get a copy of uh, Night Comes Softly and so I will I might have to come softly in the night into <laughs> your home and get me that copy um, in, on, on your shelf and it's good to know that the work that we're doing today um, has ref we have reference this work has been done before so we're not starting afresh um, and, and, and I like also what you're mentioning about the mix of, of, of things that we come from. Um, Diana's group of Mangle Moose 
poets, mango moose in, in South Africa, when they say, oh, it's a mango moose, it's yeah. a mix of, it's a mix of yeah. things. <laughs> and, and, and when our grandmothers used to say, we are cooking a mango moose, means you're putting yeah. greens and leftover meat and, and beans and everything together. And, and this is what happened also in, in the Cape where the Khoi people and the Tosa people and the, the and slaves, the slaves. Of Indonesia, yeah. well, not slaves, but yeah. enslaved people. Yeah, enslaved people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Enslaved you know, people. <laughs> all of those people, um, you know, the, these people, the, the, the indentured uh, workers of China and, and India, these people were put there together and they did what they, what they did with what they had. And this is yeah. what, you, what you're saying. And we appreciate this. We are doing what we can with our words. Maneo, you as a queer person, working within a queer space. I mean, we're working in, in, in queer spaces that now we are putting our voices out there in a world that said being queer is un-African, being queer is, is, is a sin. Just like, just like not so long ago, we were told being black was a sin. Being black was not part of, of the mix uh, um, of things. How then, as, as an editor, I know you're editing uh, our, our wonderful Kolega Putuma's book. I know that you are uh, um, editing cross, cross borders with other young, brilliant people. How do you take from the work that Diana is doing, the work that uh, Nikki has done over the years? How do you put your thoughts and, and, and your vision together from the past to now into, into the future. What I love so, so much, even by sitting on this panel, um, is, is understanding that knowledge and time as a circle, especially as African people, we understand this, that we, we understand that time is not a linear, uh, we don't understand time linearly. And I think that even in the work that I do and, and, and what I'm finding, with with luminaries and and brilliant writers like Kolega, who's a gem for us, and and working as as siblings in in publishing and and siblings in in like a in in this deeply queer space, but like editing, um, Kolega's work is such a privilege because we're we're figuring it out as we move, um, but we like you said just before that we have precedent we have. We have so many examples and so many and so much work from black women, like queer people, Audre Lorde, Nikki Giovanni, we have so much. Um, so we, we never feel alone. And as and my 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 practice as a as an editor is just to let the work speak, let the work breathe, let it tell you what it wants to be and not to impose too much onto it and not to impose too many expectations onto it. And what we're building with Kolega is beautiful, I think, because she's definitely reaching back into black woman history by tapping on the, on the work and the histories of, of, of women like Miriam Makeba and, and Brenda Fassi specifically, um, explicitly in the work. And she writes through through those people and through through those elders, um, as a way to try and understand her own black celebrity, to understand what it means to have a voice in a deeply white-dominated, male-dominated world, what it means then to write, um, to be revered, but also to be both hyper-visible and invisible. Yeah. That there are only parts of you that Europe wants to see. There's only parts of you that, that cis heteropatriarchy wants to see. But when you speak about your joy as someone who, and I, I gotta, we live in a, in a market that tells you that you, you're only valuable if you write about trauma, mm -hmm. that you are only legible if you write about trauma and pain, but all, as soon as you write about black joy, all of a sudden there's a problem. And I think that we're, we're being cheeky and we're being, um, but also deep, like following a deep, deep 
um, ancestral um, calling, I suppose, and direction of, of writers writing about black joy. Um, we, and in no ways is, is this, should this be a surprise? People have been writing, black people have been writing about joy for centuries. And I think that it's important <laughs> for centuries. And I think it's, it's, it's such an honor to, to join that lineage, just to count our voices, to stand up and, and be heard in, in that. Yeah, I, it's such a privilege. Yeah. That's what the music does. That's what exactly. makes it, and that's why the music has lived so long is that it has the joy, exactly what, she, what she's saying. You know, from spirituals, and it's amazing that we have over a thousand spirituals, American, Black American spirituals, and not one, not one deals with vengeance. It's, it's an amazing thing. But we oh. went from spiritual, uh, look, you can look it up. But yes. one, we didn't, we went from spirituals to uh, uh, blues to uh, jazz and all of it, you talk about joy. We have, as you all know, you're South African. We have a King of England, Edward VIII, who resigned his throne so that he could live in Harlem with the woman he wanted. I don't know, I'm not gonna deal with loved or whatever, but he wanted to screw her. With that woman so that he could live in Harlem and pat his foot to our jazz. Cause that's what, oh. that's what, that's what it was all about. You can, you, can, you can look at it, that was what it's all about. And I think it's wonderful, so thank you. But you know what else I'm, I've been trying to work on, uh, not trying, I am working on it, is that women outlive men. And I've been aware of it because we in America, we have a, a, a health situation that your spouse can sign for you. If, if I had a heart attack right now, my spouse could sign me into the hospital. But if I don't have a spouse, I could lay here on the floor and die. Nobody could help me. And I've been thinking about women, excuse me, women are gonna have to marry each other. It's just something they keep calling it and call it queer and call it whatever suits them. But the reality is women are gonna have to think about marrying each other because we outlive the men. And the men, of course, when they want to show that they are, that they are powerful, the most powerful man on earth wears a dress, the Pope. Am I right or wrong? Yeah, <laughs> no, that's a good. one of the richest men on earth is, is 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 Arab, and he wears a dress. So dresses <laughs> and women are clearly important. And, and women are think about it. No, and, and and some of us are going to marry these women because we love them and we think they're fine. I mean, who that's listen? We think they're fine. We're talking about this joy and I am so delighted. I find so much joy in, in, in the three of you. I wish we did not have just an hour. I think they're wrong. Hey, Poetry Africa, you better give us more time next time. <laughs> um, I, I, wanted, I wanted to just hear um, Diana's short remarks also on the joy because I, I think I think as, as black people, as African people with in all our shades and mixtures, and I think there is something, there is a, a, a link to a humane chain that, 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 is, that holds us together. The, the music of it, the, the herbs that we, that we learn from generation to generation, the, the spirituals that you talk about, the words, mm -hmm that we tell our young when, when we are carrying them before, you know, the understanding of life. And it brings us to what Maneo was talking about, that we're not all about, about the trauma, but the joy just, you know, we're not, we, we, we will tell these stories without vengeance. And when you said that, Nikki, Diana just, I, I saw a hallelujah in yeah. place. Tell us yeah. about that. No, I've, I've I've never thought about that. And, and if I now think back at all, um, um, it, it's true what Nikki said. It's it, there's songs with no vengeance. And um, I think that, you know, despite, and we can, uh, we black people all over the world, we can talk about, you know, in spite of being trampled upon, we always rise, you know, 
And we don't rise with a vengeance, we rise with joy. We rise, I mean, if you look at, this, at the enslaved, at the Cape, um, what did they bring? They brought a special kind of beat to the music that they call the guma beat. It's a, it's, it's a beat that comes from Malagasy yeah. and it comes from Indonesia. You know, uh -huh. all the, and, and once per year, they were given a day off. And that is on second new year. And what did they do? do? They packed up their stuff. They went to picnic and they took their guma drums along and they made music and they, and they danced, even if it was just for one day. So it's important what Maneo said and what um, uh, Nikki said, um, we should not allow anybody to take our joy away. And we should encourage, um, you know, our musicians, our poets, our writers to go look for that joy because sometimes we can get so engulfed in just our sufferings, you know, but let's go and see where our people rose with joy. I mean, there's Miriam Akeba, what happened to Miriam? But what did she bring us? Yeah. There's Abdullah Ibrahim, what did he bring us? And they tell our stories with yeah. so much joy. And that is what I also want to do. I don't only want to, um, you know, write about the heavy times. I also want to, as I said with Sarki, I want to come home. I want to come home and to have peace. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That this peace and, and joy are possible amidst the trauma. And it's not to, to, to just, uh, avoid or ignore that we were not enslaved and raped and beaten, yeah. but that yeah. the, the, that we can also go to other places that, and also to prove that the thing that they were trying to kill in us, the thing yeah. that they're still trying to kill in us every single day. Yeah. Is they're not, they're not succeeding to do that. Yeah. And in, in very subtle ways, eh? Yeah, in very yeah. subtle ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, by um, I mean, if I talk about the literary um, industry and, and, and talk about, about what is allowed and what is not allowed, and that's yeah. why we should we should write against that. We should write against that all the time. If well, I take I the story, I, I like if I take the story of Sarki. Yeah, Sarki Say again. came home. I yeah. take the story, story of Sarah Bartman of Sarki, I call her, it's endearing name. Um, she came home. She came home after 192 years, a coffin draped in the South African flag. The French minister had to ask, um, we must ask ourselves who the real monster is in the story. They had to ask us forgiveness because they were wrong. And that's the joy that we have. That's the joy that we tell. Our sister came home, our ancestor who never had any hope is buried in the village where she comes from. Yeah, and I, I mean, I wish I could go on and on and, and, and just, just be in, in your light um, for the next couple of hours. But I, I want to, as we draw closer and closer to the time that we have together for the sitting, because I know that time will bring us together again. I, I'm gonna ask each of you to, to give us a poem or two. Um, but but bef as you say this poem or before you say this poem, I, I would like, for you to kind of take us into this intellectual integrity. I mean, I look at poems and I see um, a, a witness bearing when you write your work, be it of pain, of trauma, of rage, of joy, there is an intellectual integrity of, of witness bearing. There is an intellect, there is an intentionality in there um, with this work, this language. What, it, what is it when you write it in solitary, um, when you share it collectively, what is it? So for, for, for each one of you, as you say it, 
you say your poem, but say also, this is what I intended. This is what, what I meant. Just, just very short because time obviously, but, but I just wanna, wanna hear this. I'm going to start with Manel. <laughs> Um, okay, <laughs> I'm so shy, but um, my, the poem that I want to read is the first poem in my book, um, and the intention, so the, 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 the poem is called Lidzadzi, which means many things actually, Kasasoto, because Sasoto is such a deeply poetic language, and, um, and a kaleidoscopic language in that you can look at one word from different directions and the word itself also fractures in different directions. But Lidzadzi both means the sun, but can also mean the day or a day, a singular day, which I think is a beautiful connection, but it also can mean the dawn. So like sunrise. So I, I wanted to start the book with light um, because much of my book deals with violence and empire and um and pain but but trauma from a space of, of also that that asks to fracture a particular experience to so that we can look at it not as one thing so anyway before i go blah 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 blah, blah. um this is Lidzati. in your mother's red gulf you ask her what Bononi means. Son of my sorrow. Hearing the sun instead, you turn the word over in your mind like a coin. Ghosts are living in mind dumps as your mother drives you home. Honeycomb mountains are brittle. Tomorrow, you ask her for a crunchy after school. Like all names of the Bible, Bononi sounds ancient. Out your mother's mouth, magic, menjink, magic. You are still small enough to hide inside the good book's rice paper pages. You do not know yet what you are. Have not had Leviticus angled at you like an ice pick. For now, the Bible is a hand drum for women draped in white and blue. Kok at home. In a pockmarked garage, there are women made of clouds and ocean. They make terrifying sea-wide music. Skubu, the plastic bottom of everything that has a heart. Shells and bottle tops on ankles. How neatly old and new gods sit together. In school, you meet a man named Cecil John and learn the word pioneer. Turn the word over in your mind like a coin. Your mother is a witness. Your mother is a pioneer, not yet knocking on doors to tell people about the good news. You wonder if Cecil was a witness too. Wonder on whose doors he knocked, for which God, to spread what good news. Woof. Thank you. Thank you, Manel. That is from the book, Every... Every, um, every, let's see that every, oh God, um, <laughs> everything is a deathly flower. How do I forget this book? Everything <laughs> is a deathly flower. Beautiful, beautiful book. And then I am going to go to my two gorgeous, gorgeous Diana. I should, I should go, I should go to you. I'm back to my ageist um, <laughs> tendency. Okay, um, thank you. <laughs> Um, I wrote this poem and it's going to debut in Wild Imperfections. That's where, and it's called My Mother Was a Storm. Mm -hmm. And it's a reminder that there were always women who fought against the status quo, who fought against stuff that was wrong in society. My mother was a storm, a sky filled with dark clouds. She could threaten or just burst open. She gave warnings before she lashed, a thundering tongue uprooting old dead trees, theories. My mother cleaned with an iron duster. She swept away all dirt and falsehoods. My mother risked having a name tarnished, but 
could not be tamed. I did not want to see her rain down so freely. She had to stop before it became too wet. I feared a drowning. I feared those floods that had me gasping for air. I thought my mother was too intense a winter. Knew that she carried a summer, but one in which flash floods hid. Oh, but how I long for that storm now, a fierce and all-encompassing one, these days in which hard rocks bash, tear at skin and soul. I wish my mother could enter the sky and with an angry wind gather the clouds, rain down hard and dissolve those rocks still so intact, so smug, Today, I need my mother. Thank oh, you. We all need that mother. Yes, Nikki. Oh, that was lovely <laughs> and honored. And, that and was lovely, you. Diana. And thank you for dedicating that poem to Wild Imperfections, an anthology yeah. of women's <laughs> poems. Thank you. Thank you. I'm honored to, to read with, with both of these ladies and thank you very much for allowing it. And Diana, thank you. You, yes. were, thank you, but you were talking about rain and my new book is called Make Me Rain. And I'm doing the same thing. My mother has passed and you also want the rain because rain is what makes everything live. It's the water. Oh, thank you, Nikki. <laughs> <laughs> so we're on the same page here. Make me <laughs> Make me rain, turn me into a snowflake. Let me rest on your tongue. Make me a piece of ice so I can cool you. Let me be the cloud that embraces you or the quilt that keeps you dry. Struggle close, listen to me sing on the windowsill. Make me rain on you. Oh, <laughs> oh. So, Diane and I both doing the water, but this rain. <laughs> yeah, taking it from the sky, the, yeah, yeah. I wish we had more time, but we don't. Um, and the poet becomes a rebirth of wonder where change is possible, where healing is possible. And the poet is the people. And the people are the earth, the sky, the water, and the life force that our ancestors danced and died for. Oh. I want to thank the three of you for joining me in conversation, a very short conversation that only is beginning, does not have an end. I want to thank our ancestors for giving us this voice that we can collectively share. I want to thank Poetry Africa for giving us this moment that we can share. And all the partners, hear my voice, are young people who know how to tech savvy the situations. Um, I want to really just give you the props for holding it down when it's difficult, when there are hailstorms and hurricanes, especially the older ones. Mm -hmm. There I go with my ageist uh, tendencies. <laughs> but the older ones, Maneo, you will agree that the older ones carry us on their shoulders and we see you. We don't take you for granted. We do the kind of work that we do because you showed us that it is possible across oceans, over mountains. You showed us beyond the sky. You showed us that we can do this and hence we are doing it so that future people can know that it is possible. Can, can I just... Um just before, just tell Nikki that in the 70s, she, together with James Baldwin, you know, they were our dream heroes. I just <laughs> want to say thank you to her. I never knew that I would meet her, even if it's just virtually. Thank you. I, 
I want to add. What do you want to say? Please, I'm sorry. I also want to add my voice and and give unsayable and unexpressible thanks. Thank you, thank you, Nikki. This is. What do you want to say? And thank you, Diana. Thank you. Thank you, Manu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nikki, what do you want to say? I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to all of us. And I hope one day, and especially Cape Town, because it's so lovely, I'll find myself in Cape Town again, able to, to make this do with you. <laughs> come and come we all, <laughs> we're all going to make a stew, I promise. We are making a stew in all our individual and collective work. I'm coming to Virginia Tech to take all your books home with me. I'm coming to Cape Town to do the Mango Moose poems. And yes, <laughs> and yes. All, <laughs> you're going to edit some of this work. But um, to just in closing say, I am grateful that you made the time. I am grateful also that you were generous to contribute your poems to Wild Imperfections, a global anthology of womanist poems, which will come out in 2021 from Cassava Republic Press in September, from Penguin Random House in July, and you will have your copies and it will be a space of gathering from all of us as we gather from South Africa and the US and the UK and Scotland and, and Nigeria and Somalia and Sudan so that the conversation can continue. Um, we have one minute, one word that each one of you want to say, one word. Diana, go. Rewarding. Thank yes. you. Manel. <laughs> Um, Malebo, just Malebo. <laughs> Thank you, Nikki. Peace. peace, peace, and with that, I say peace too. I say rewarding moments. I say Malebo. Thank you. My name is Natalia Molebazzi, and it has been an honor and a privilege to be here with you. Um, continue to see Poetry Africa. Go to the Facebook page of Poetry Africa as we continue this mango mousse, this mix of a port of the festival. It's not over. We end on the 17th. It's wonderful. Go and, and join us for more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, friends. Um, and see you again.